Hello music lovers, welcome to episode 82 of What Makes This Song Special. As always, I've got a song for you, a song that takes me back to a story from my life, a time in my life. Um, I'll be talking about the song as well, a little bit about the band, about the singer, a little bit of a vocal coach analysis of the singer at the end. Um, and then a part two where you can hear me cover my own version of, of today's song, which is of course, Where the Streets Have No Name by U2. Um, so we'll dive straight in. Um, 1991, we're going way back now, 1991. Um, I was living in a little street called Flanders Avenue in Clarkson in the south side of Glasgow. I've spoken about my time living in that street before on the channel, the Chesney Hawks, I am the one and only episode in particular. Um, a great place, lots of beautiful memories for me. Um, a place that I met lots of great friends it was a it was a street full of kids a bit like the street that I live in now my kids get that kind of um experience where almost every house has got kids they all go out and play in the street and it's, it's great um and that was the type of street that it was for me and my brothers um and a couple of doors up there was a family called the O'Donnells um the kids were also three brothers which pretty much about they were, I think, exactly the same age as, as me and my brothers as well, if not a year or so out. So naturally, they were some of the, the first friends that we made in the street. Um, and in the October, after we, about a year after we moved in there, it was my 10th birthday. And I remember sitting on the couch with my big cousin, Peter, um, staring in awe as he held and played something called uh, a Nintendo Game Boy. It was the first ever handheld games console I think so anyway definitely the one the first one I remember um it was a thing of absolute beauty um and I was completely captivated by this little machine that we could put cartridges in and play play different games um I remember he was playing a game called Castlevania um and I honestly I still get like this kind of warm fuzzy feeling when I think about the sound um from those games like the Mario Brothers games the Tetris games the little tunes even the little sound it made when you switched it on and switched it off um, gives me this kind of like nostalgic, um, you know, just a nostalgia for a time of just excitement, you know, as, as a child when all these new technological advances were, were being thrust into the world. It was amazing. Um, and I can remember it like it was yesterday. I remember just sitting, taking turns on the Game Boy on the couch and the, and the doorbell went and... Uh, my mum shouted on me to come to the door and it was the O'Donnell brothers with some, I think, some sweets or chocolates or whatever and a birthday card for me, which was very nice. And when I opened the card, it was a, it was a U2 birthday card. Uh, it's like a picture of U2, like, sort of from, a picture taken from, sort of like from far away and they were on the stage, really random. Um, a U2 birthday card. And I... Yeah, I was. I'm almost embarrassed to admit this just now, but I actually didn't know who they were. Um, I'd never heard of you two, and there was this message inside the card that said, "Oh, um, something like we know you love your rock bands. Um, I hope you like the card." And I was like, "Who the hell are you two? Um, I was into Guns and Roses and Bon Jovi and bands like Poison and stuff like that as well. And, um, but not you two. I don't know why I'd kind of they. I just, I don't know, I suppose they're slightly different rock band to, to that type of rock band that I was into. Um, but yeah, I hadn't heard of them. So fast forward a year or two and uh, we were leaving Flanders Avenue. Um, my best pal at the time in the street was a guy called Matthew who lived a, a couple of doors down and we were saying goodbye. I remember <laughs> a couple of kids crying because we didn't know if we were going to see each other again. Um, we were moving to Italy the next day. Um, that story, another story I've told on the on the channel, which is the Simply Red Stars episode way back at the beginning, one of the first ever episodes. Um, but that was about us, you know, moving away to Italy and we're sitting in the front seat or the front seats of my mum and dad's Volkswagen Jetta whilst my parents were packing up the house to, to, to move out and leave. And we were crying our eyes out and promising we would stay in touch somehow, you know. And this is long before the internet and mobile phones. and um, So staying in touch with people was, was going to prove difficult. Um, so anyway, we moved to Italy. We lived there for about a year. We came back and I really wanted to get in touch with Matthew, but 
we didn't really have any way of getting in touch. We'd heard that he'd moved house. And as I said, there wasn't a mobile number that you phoned back then to call somebody. Um, I don't know how many years later it was until I saw him, but a substantial amount of time had passed. And by this point, I was we were renting this house in, in a little village called Waterfoot. And again, this is hazy because we're talking, you know, I was a kid. I can't remember how long, how far back this was. But I think my mum had bumped into somebody who knew Matthew or knew Matthew's mum or something and realised that he was living actually in the next village to us, a wee village up the road called Eaglesome. Um, So a meeting was was set up and I remember my mum dropped me at his house and she came out to say hello and stuff. And then she left me um, at, at Matthew's new house where he was staying um, to hang out for a bit and said she'd pick me up later on and um, it was like a sunny sunny afternoon and I remember he came out to meet me wearing wearing a U2 t-shirt uh, I think it was a Joshua U2 Joshua tree, um, uh, t-shirt and it made for a conversation starter you know when you've not seen somebody for a long time and we started talking about the O'Donnells and about that birthday card that I got all those years ago and we had a laugh about it and we sat in Matthew's room and we talked about our life since we'd last seen each other. And he put on some U2 because, of course, I'd admitted that I'd never still at this point. I think by this point I'd heard some U2 songs, but I wasn't really, I didn't really know much about them. Um, so he stuck on the Joshua Tree album uh, on his CD player. And of course, the first song on that album is Where the Streets Have No Name. At the time, you know, at the time it wasn't really my thing. Um, I remember thinking, when's this intro going to end and when's the song going to start? You know, it's like it's too long. Um, but I politely, you know, said to him, no, oh, I'm loving it, it's great, you know, because it was like at the time maybe his favourite band. So I was like, yeah, yeah, this is great. I really like it, it's nice. And we ended up listening to like the whole album in the background as we were chatting. And and to be honest, like, I remember feeling quite sad when I left that day because Matthew had changed like he wasn't the best pal that I left that day in the Volkswagen Jetta when we were 11 or 12 years old. And I don't mean that like he changed into a not a nice guy. Like he was a lovely guy, but we just sort of, we'd lost three or four years of each other's lives and it just kind of felt a bit awkward. I remember just feeling quite sad that we were like quite shy and awkward talking to each other. There were these moments of silence where we didn't really know what to say. And, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't think we ever had those moments a few years earlier when we were just young kids playing in, in the street. And I'm sure he felt that had changed too. You know, by this point, we were teenagers. We'd had different lives. We had different life experiences. We went to different schools, had different types of friends. We weren't the little kids that flew down the streets in our bikes and our skateboards anymore. You know, and I felt, I felt quite empty. That night, I remember after we left, I just felt like kind of, I'd been quite excited about seeing him again, but we'd both just changed. We'd both grown up a bit. And I don't think I saw Matthew again after that for, for quite a long time, um, which didn't really kind of keep that friendship going. Or It was awkward. I think he was moving around a lot. So were we. And as I said, you know, no mobile, no mo- mobile phones and WhatsApp messages and stuff, which make things very easy these days. Back then... You had to make much, much more of an effort to actually keep in touch with folk uh, if you didn't live right beside them or whatever. So for years afterwards, I never really got you 2 I always thought they were hugely overrated, apart from, you know, a few amazing songs that everybody loves, um, like With or Without You and um, well, I suppose the, Where the Streets Have No Name. And uh, yeah, there are, there are lots of great... Uh, U2 songs um, but I didn't love them and I always felt like why are they so big like why do people love them so much I just like didn't get it and then as I've alluded to many times on this channel with lots of different artists I think I was wrong you know <laughs> I'm not saying they've become my favourite band but god they're a great band but they've got so many unbelievable songs the first three songs in the Joshua Tree album in particular as it moves from Where the Streets Have No Name to Still Haven't Found What I'm Looking For um, to With or Without You, my God. Just <laughs> what an album, what, you know, great songs. And that sound as well that I suppose the guitarist, The Edge, 
kind of um, is as a well mostly um, to praise for, I suppose, with that kind of with those layered up guitars and delay pedals and stuff. And I'll talk about that in a wee minute when we talk about the song. But that um, that sound is is sonically beautiful. You know, it was like really incredible. Probably a lot to do with the production from you know, Lanwa and Brian Eno and all these people that got involved as well. But they are just a, a great sounding band and probably a band who did something sonically that was really interesting. Um, you know, maybe the first band to kind of really do that since Pink Floyd, maybe before them, where they pushed the sort of boundaries of, of, of pop music with, with the kind of unusual production and all that stuff so anyway um definitely an, imp- an important band and, and a great band a really great band as i said i had to kind of uh, eat my words on that um but uh and they've, they've grown on me they've definitely grown on me but uh, every time i hear where the streets have no name i think of that day with matthew and eaglesome i think of the day where we i think we both realized that you know the little kids we'd we'd been friends with weren't really there anymore um, and that's not to say if I met Matthew tomorrow and went for a coffee or a beer with him that we wouldn't end up having a great time reminiscing you know realising we've got loads in common becoming great pals again 30 years on you know it's who knows but at that moment when we'd both kind of grown into teenagers and had different life experiences something kind of disappeared and we moved on with our lives so that is what the song reminds me of um, as always you know I tell you why it's an important song to me um that's what that song reminds me of it takes me back to that day um it takes me to a few different things in my life to be fair it's been a, an important song i love that song but where the streets have no name we'll talk about the actual song itself it is of course a song by irish rock legends you two um it begins with this dreamy infectious shoegazy guitar arpeggio played on a delay pedal which sort of captures you and then the drums come in and the bass comes in and it it turns into this anthem that takes you on this like journey um as i said before this kind of sonic journey um it's really cool really incredible um bono the the lead singer of course everybody knows who bono is um he said that he wrote the lyrics about the notion that it's possible to identify a person's religion and social standing based on the street where they lived i think this is probably more relevant to like irish streets where there was a huge divide at the time between catholic and protestant although i don't think he was just talking about that i think he 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 once said in an interview the guy in the song recognizes this contrast and thinks about a world where there aren't such divisions a place where the streets have no name um he said that to him, that was why a great rock and roll concert, or what a great, great rock and roll concert should be, a place where everyone comes together, regardless of their background. Um, and maybe that's the dream of all art, to break down the barriers and the divisions between people and touch upon the things that matter most to us all, which is, yeah, really cool. Nice quote and and and, and pretty cool stuff, as always, from Bono. He's, I know he's a divisive character, but he's a, he's a good guy. Um the the music from the, the track came from a demo that The Edge, the guitarist, had written in his house on a four-track tape machine. He'd put down an, ar- an arrangement of keyboards, bass, guitars, all those delay pedals and, and a drum machine and said afterwards that he was really looking to create a song that would be the perfect live anthem. And he created it from the perspective of what he thought he'd want the band to sound like if he was a fan at one of their concerts. It was a pretty cool way of looking at songwriting. Um, when the band came together to try and record the song, they couldn't make sense of it. Um, there are time signature changes, lots of effects, lots of things going on, um, lots of things needed for it to really come together. And as a band, they decided to ditch the song during the recording, um, only to re- revisit it and start again from scratch a while later. And I think I speak for millions of people all around the world when I say I'm so glad that they did revisit it and not leave it in the bin, because it would have been imagine a world without that without that song you know of course for them as well became one of the band's biggest uh, and most recognisable songs in their incredibly impressive back catalogue of now almost almost 50 years and I think you two have been going I think their first album came out in 19 
80, but they've been together, I think, since the mid-70s. So they've definitely been together for about 50 years. And then when they got signed and released Boy, which I think is the first album. I might be wrong here. I'm just I'm pulling this out of the back of my head. Um, I'm sure it was 1980, so you're talking 45 years ago. I mean, that is absolutely or 44 years ago I mean that's crazy so and they're still going they're still you know they're still huge they're still gigging um, and he's still singing I mean that takes us on to you know um, perfectly on to um, talking about the vocal coach analysis on Bono's voice um, where do I start with Bono's voice I mean it's instantly recognisable it's distinctive he's got the voice of a preacher you know a lot of the time it's in that call register where Whatever he says and whatever he sings about, you'll you listen. You're listening to what he's telling you. Um, it's anthemic quality, really draws you in and makes you want to sing along. It's the perfect rock star voice, you know, rock band voice. It's it's in that perfect place that that cuts through the guitars and the bass and the drums. It's in that perfect register um, that cuts through for that type of music as well. It's quite shouty quite pulled in chest voice at times if, if we're talking about you know his technique um but he plays with all of the registers really well he moves the gears seamlessly not just because he has to but to change the overall tone at times for the good of conveying the emotion of the lyric of each song which is a real art um and in his mid 60s he's still singing really well i think there was a wee bit of a dip you know a while back where it's felt like he was on the decline and some of the songs were coming down a few keys and um but recently watching the watching the kind of live um videos that have emerged from the what's it called the sphere is it that new that big venue in vegas i think it's called the sphere um and obviously you two have been there gigging uh, his voice still sounds great and i think everything's still maybe Almost original key, maybe dropped a semitone, but I mean, that's nothing when you're in your 60s. That is really impressive. So, um, yeah, Bono, legend, absolute legend. But but there we go. There's my little story um, this week for the episode. Uh, you know, that's what the song takes me back to. It takes me back to that day when I met up with Matthew. And it's a great song. It's a great song. I'm sure this song has touched many lives. So please leave some comments. Um, if this is a special song to you um, hit the subscribe button hit the like button hit the share button um, hit the link button um, to hear me do my own version on the piano of Where the Streets Have No Name if you're interested to hear how that might sound um, if you're interested in vocal coaching if you would like any lessons help you with your voice um, then get in touch as well we can jump on Skype or Zoom or whatever um, and yeah, thanks for tuning in. I will see you next week for another song, another story. Cheers. <laughs>